In the 50s, a famous psychologist, Leon Festinger, infiltrated and studied a cult who predicted that the world would end on the 21st of December 1954, but that the cult members would be rescued by aliens. After the appointed hour had come and gone, rather than admit they were wrong, Festinger found that the cult members actually became more evangelical about their beliefs, not less. It transpired that the aliens had sent a message overnight, saying that they were so impressed by the devotion of the cult that the world had been saved. Was this rather curious event and Festinger's insights into a psychological phenomenon that he termed cognitive dissonance, of relevance to my own investigation? It was as I was leaving the hotel at the end of my Swedish adventures that I realised I had forgotten to put a rather important suspect in the dock, the intellectual establishment, who had bought in to the dramatic predictions by Neil Ferguson and Imperial College in March 2020. This had been promulgated through highly respected media outlets such as BBC's Radio 4. If one just imagines everybody in the country getting this disease at the same time, then you have a whole year's worth of deaths suddenly happening over the next couple of weeks. And just imagining what, would, what that would do to the hospitals, what that would do to the oh. cemeteries, it would be absolutely horrific. And, and that's exactly what the Imperial Group found in their analysis. They said that if the virus was just allowed to let rip, we did absolutely nothing. Then around 80% of people would get it and about half a million would die. I've just been listening to a couple of podcasts, Radio 4, more or less show, broadcast in March and then May. And the one broadcast in March was kind of quite interesting to me because it made me sort of like doubt myself. It made me wonder whether or not I've got completely the wrong end of the stick here. One thing that seems to be going around is, well, it's like the flu. I mean, just looking at, at flu and flu deaths, is it like the flu? Well, no, it's about twice as infectious as the flu and about roughly ten times as dangerous, perhaps. Twice as infectious and ten times as dangerous. Here was a highly respected member of the SAGE committee, that veritable galaxy of experts that advised the government to lock down. The importance of distinguished experts like Sir David Spiegelhalter cannot be overstated. The government completely relied on the SAGE committee's recommendations. And the messaging also went the other way, rippling out through highly respected media outlets, reaching the educated middle classes who might not trust politicians, but would certainly listen to eminent experts on the BBC. What my doubt came from was here was someone who might already formed a kind of preliminary view of respect such that I was brought in to uh, believe what he had to tell me. From the outset, I had nevertheless struggled with the basic idea that a disease could be both highly infectious and highly deadly. Flu is infectious and sometimes deadly, and the common cold, of course, is highly infectious but not at all deadly. Other diseases like AIDS or even rabies are not very infectious at all, but highly deadly. Was it really possible that a disease could be both? It was a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. But in the film Smith Contagion, this was the premise, a disease both highly infectious and highly deadly. We have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. The whole point of such movies is to play on our darkest fears of the worst of all worlds so we can vicariously experience a roller coaster ride of terrors, returning to normal life with a sigh of relief afterwards. What are you talking about? Rather depressingly, the film had been referenced by the British Health Secretary during an interview in the context of his policy response to the pandemic. 
But are such movies really a reflection of the real world? It was not very long before David Spiegelhalter's comments on the Radio 4 show seemed fantastic themselves. Having originally estimated it as 34 times more deadly than the flu in March, the WHO itself published a paper in June estimating its lethality as way below anything that Spiegelhalter had referred to. Barely twice as deadly, or actually even less, as the study focused on harder hit more dense areas of population. It went unnoticed and unreported in the media. Experts in Sweden were infected by the fearful predictions and applied Ferguson's model to their country, laying out predicted death and hospitalisation rates for competing policy scenarios in a series of graphs. According to their projections, the Swedish government's response if they did not lock down, would pass 40,000 deaths shortly after the 1st of May 2020 and continue to rise to almost 100,000 deaths by June. Of course, Sweden's government ignored them and stayed the course with its milder mitigation strategy and as of April 29th, Sweden's death toll from COVID-19 stood at 2,462 and its hospitals were nowhere near the projected collapse. The most interesting voices, perhaps, were those on the ground, such as funeral directors. And I noticed that in uh, 2020 of April and March, I had 12 consecutive nights where I was called to go exclusively to care homes. And that isn't normal. That, that, that's never happened in 15 years. I'm a small family-run business. That, that was really, really unusual, and it screamed first wave. That lasted from uh, January, February, March till about the, the second week in April. It was two weeks, very intense. I remember being extremely tired at the time because the phone rang every night at three or four in the morning to another care home. And then as quickly as it started, it totally stopped. But the, the deliberate attempts to label every regular death with COVID continued, and it was really intense. So why had Dr Spiegelhalter and the SAGE board not at least revised their opinion after the initial panic had passed and neither hospitals nor cemeteries were overrun? Surprisingly, principal SAGE members seemed to want to continue to pursue the Hollywood narrative, inflating the dangers and risks with their fantastic graphs. We now have statistics that suggest that it is actually no more deadly for those under 70 than the flu, and for those over 70, only twice as deadly, not 10 times. What was going on? Leon Festinger's study of the end-of-world cult was the practical real-world application of a theory he had already arrived at through a series of experiments. He gave subjects a deliberately pointless task but split them into two groups. The first were paid good money, the second only one dollar. What was interesting was that the second group were more passionate about the pointless task than those who had been properly paid. In an experiment last week, and she said it was very tedious. Oh, I don't think that was the same experiment because this one wasn't boring at all. I didn't think so. In order to deal with the dissonance between their beliefs in the task, and the discomfort of the fact that the task was actually pointless, they manufactured justifications. I think maybe your friend was wrong. Perhaps it was a different experiment, because this was a lot of fun. It, it appeared to me as if, a, for, as if it were a puzzle. We you know, had to turn these knobs, and I tried to figure out what we were doing it for, but I really couldn't figure it out. Perhaps you'll have better Whereas life. those who had been paid already had their justification, the money, and were happy to denounce the task. As he said purpose. it was pretty miserable, and that I should do everything I could to uh, get out of it. Other theories might predict that the man who was paid most would have the highest motivation for enthusing over the dull task, and would be most sold on it himself. Cognitive dissonance theory leads to an exactly opposite prediction. The man who was paid $20 
knows that the task is dull, but he also knows that he had sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. How about the man who is paid one dollar? He knows the task is dull, but he has two discrepant thoughts. He also knows that he did not have sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. For him, there is dissonance. Time after time, we have seen what follows. He reduces the dissonance by changing his opinion about the dullness of the task. And it's interesting because in Sweden here, they have a completely different approach, which is starting to kind of be borne out. I mean, they've not got, they have not got, by no means have they got, by orders of magnitude have they been suffering any, uh, any like the, the, the sorts of deaths that if the imperial model was applied to Sweden, uh, you, you might expect to happen. But I think what is interesting is that, you know, once the argument is set, once the agenda is there, once all your intelligentsia and your scientists, your professionals, or the, the, the rump of them, once your government is convinced uh, of what I've just described, 1%, highly infectious, 80% of us are going to get it, and you model that out, whoa! It's end of story, and you you can see why people like Peter Hitchens and other critics of uh, lockdown are so uh, frustrated because they're not allowed even to have that argument any longer. That argument has been closed. Festinger concluded that believers would find it difficult to abandon their beliefs and would even use their available social support to maintain their beliefs and try to increase consonance by recruiting others to their belief on the grounds that if more and more people can be persuaded that the system of belief is correct, then clearly it must, after all, be correct. Stop there. Yeah. So we, where are we exactly? We are here now. Why have the experts not changed their tune with growing evidence of Sweden, a highly developed society, demonstrating that there was another way, a voluntary, more targeted approach? Indeed, before Ferguson's report landed on the capacious boardroom table at Sage, with what must have been quite a thud, the UK had been following Sweden's strategy. It seemed to me that initially the SAGE members would have had no choice but to accept without question the advice of an expert on an area of expertise entirely outside their skill set. Spiegelhalter, for example, was a statistician, not an epidemiologist. But as the panic passed, had the SAGE members perhaps found themselves somewhat cornered. As a professional myself, a lawyer, I know all too well the difficulties of backtracking on wrong advice, especially late into a case when the stakes suddenly loom large. Perhaps it was not impossible to imagine that cognitive dissonance had been at work. In fact, Sage had heavily invested into the lockdown narrative and had actually advised the government to use fear to ensure compliance. The government had been only too happy to oblige. Boris Johnson, deciding perhaps it was safest to defer to the medical experts and protect the NHS, rolled out an impressive marketing campaign every bit as effective as his Brexit campaign had been that had swept him to power the previous year. It worked only all too well. Um, I had, uh, early on in the process in 2020, I had a pandemic guy that would ring me up every week. He announced himself, he rung the, the phone, I picked the phone up, he announced himself as a government-sponsored pandemic guy and he said he would be calling me every week um, he asked me what my capacity was for deceased, um, how many people I'd picked up that week and how many were COVID uh, and perhaps where they'd come from as well. So I would kind of every week he would call and, and I hasten to add it wasn't any one person. A number of pers different people undertook this task and I was speaking to them on a weekly basis and I was found that the conversation was being kind of steered. Um, so, for example, on a Monday I would get a call, I would say, yeah, I picked up a gentleman and a lady, both in their 90s from care home, there was no COVID test done, they didn't appear to be COVID, and as far as I'm aware, they're not COVID deaths. And then he would kind of say to me, okay, but wasn't there COVID in that care home? 
wasn't there COVID in that hospital wing? Do you know, deliberately steering me into into saying there were COVID deaths or into him recording them as COVID deaths to his end. And that wasn't once and wasn't one conversation. The SAGE members found themselves centre stage. Now the front men in the limelight. Well, Ferguson and Imperial itself now seem to start to contort things to suit their position. When challenged about the Swedish projections based on his own model, Ferguson claimed that, in effect, Sweden were in a kind of lockdown anyway. The, 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 the results with the mitigated stress, you might have been better than you forecast. I mean, to be clear, I mean, Sweden are not adopting a mitigation strategy. What they have is a sort of semi-suppression strategy. Once the panic had subsided and the initial policy of flattening the curb was in the rearview mirror, had there been any proper review by government? No, because the government was wedded to its lockdown policy and did not want to experience the dissonance of other facts jarring with its belief system. Deliberately refused to even publish an assessment of the disadvantages and long-term dangers of lockdown. And that is a lack of data about the costs of the decisions that are being taken. Costs for non-COVID non treatment in NHS, non-COVID deaths, domestic abuse, uh, mental health, possibly more suicides, and of course, cost to the economy. Jobs lost, livelihoods shattered, businesses failing, yep. whole sectors damaged. What sort of airline industry are, you going, are we going to have coming out of this? What sort of hospitality sector? How many small independent shops will be left? The government must have made this analysis, they must have made this assessment, let us see it and make our own judgments. As Festinger had explained, when confronted with the dissonance of facts contradicting their beliefs, believers double down on their beliefs and contort the facts. This denial reached almost comic proportions when in the autumn of 2020, Imperial College published a self-serving set of results claiming that their predictions had been right. By a brazen effort of intellectual contortionism, they produced two reports saying diametrically opposite things. And uh, if you apply that same model across different European countries, you can estimate that about 80% uh, uh, reduction uh, of, you know, 80% or more of the benefit is due to complete lockdown. But let's take a look at model two that is at the lower tire. And again, this is exactly the same data. And what I'm showing you in this one is that actually lockdown had absolutely no benefit. You can see that the, the point that uh, lockdown is introduced, the RT is already pretty much in the range of one. So in the European data, model one shows a tremendous benefit from lockdown. Model two shows absolutely no benefit. Which of the two has a better fit from a scientific perspective? There's different tools that we can use to see which model is more accurate and most parsimonious. Actually, it's model two. But what was published in the literature was model one. I think this is why it's so interesting to be doing this mini documentary from Sweden, because here they've got a completely different narrative. They have got measures in place, but they haven't totally locked down the country. They've obviously looked at the facts of the situation from the beginning and they've just formed a different view to the UK government, and, well, to most of the other European governments. But uh, they've perhaps decided to look at the detail, to look at the, you know, to tailor their response to what they knew at the time. Sure, everyone knew that Italy was having troubles, but is that not, is, just because Italy was having troubles, does that mean that they would be having troubles in other European countries in the same way? And, and indeed, even so, did that justify a blanket res lockdown response when uh, you could have used tailored measures to deal with the problems that old people were having and the problems that the care homes were having? I mean, that would have been a tailored response. I, I can't help but think, as a matter of reason, the reasonable approach has simply been to put all your resources and energy into looking after the elderly who were, uh, who were exposed, but letting them, everyone else get on with their lives. I mean, why can't you isolate the elderly? And so, and indeed, you could invite them to be isolating themselves and they probably would follow your advice. I mean, why wouldn't you if you're an older person and you're facing the prospect of uh, death if you catch the COVID-19? The whole thing could have regulated itself just as it has regulated itself in Sweden. 
we're no different from the Swedes. We are able to take guidance, and enthusiastically take guidance, as been illustrated by our response. So what's interesting, ha having this sort of window of, of the UK from outside the UK, is how if you, if you make the decision, and it's not the right decision, there's kind of an, an organisational behavioural group thing that falls behind a bad decision as earnestly as, as if um, a, a good decision is made, perhaps even with more enthusiasm because you know how it is. We tend to defend our bad decisions in life with far more enthusiasm than we do the good ones. Against such a backdrop, I wondered just how likely it was that anyone at SAGE David Spiegelhalter, or any of the others, would have spoken up. Did you enjoy working on the manual task? Yes, I enjoyed it. Would you like to participate in such an experiment again? Yes, I think I would like to. Perhaps for the first time ever in the history of pandemic management, it also became necessary to find new ways to inflate the fear amongst the population rather than diminish it, evolving new plot lines. Now the virus was mutating into scarier, more highly infectious, perhaps more deadly variants. We really did seem to be in Hollywood fantasy land after all. But I was struggling with the idea that we had lapsed into some sort of Orwellian madness. It seemed too far-fetched. I now felt a cognitive dissonance all of my own. So I decided to put my outlandish ideas on the back burner and turn my attention to an easier target. It was time to put global corporations in the dock. This seemed a much safer subject of investigation than having to face the alarming ramifications of Festinger's theory. Surely, they would not do this to us, would they? Professor John Ioannidis, who's a colleague of mine at Stanford, uh, is a world expert in meta-analysis, probably the most cited scientist on, on Earth, I think, uh, at least living. He, he did a, a meta-analysis of now 100 or more of these seroprevalence studies. Um, and uh, uh, what he found was that that 0.2% is roughly the worldwide number. I mean, in fact, I think he cites a lower number, 0.15%, as the median infection fatality rate worldwide. So we did these studies, and it generated an enormous amount of blowback by people who thought that the infection fatality rate is much higher, confused. And you're right, it was a very important result. Because we had just locked the world down in, in middle of March with, I think, catastrophic results. And if, the, if that study was right, if our study was right, that meant we'd made a mistake. And not because the death rate was low. That's actually not the key thing there. The key thing is that we had adopted these policies, these test and trace policies, these policies, these lockdown policies aimed at suppressing the virus level to close to zero. That was essentially the idea. If we can just get the virus to go away, we won't have to ever worry about it again. The main problem with our result as far as that strategy was concerned wasn't the death rate, it was the 40 to 50 times more infections than cases. It was the 2.5% or 3% uh, or 4% prevalence rate that we identified of the antibodies in the population. If that number is right, it's too late. The virus is not going to go to zero. And no matter how much we test and trace and isolate, we're not going to get the viral level down to zero.